Good morning. Good to have you with us this morning. We have been in the book of Revelation. The focal point has been Jesus Christ. Really everything that we do, ever. Whether we're living, doing ministry, at church, away from church, no matter where we're at, it's always about Christ. The book of Revelation is about the revelation of Jesus Christ. We spent time now up through the first five chapters looking at Jesus Christ. He is the revelation. He's giving the revelation. It is from his mouth. It is from him, his messengers. But more importantly, it's about him. It's revealing Jesus Christ and how he is going to bring everything that is in the word of God to complete completion. He is fulfilling the word of God and his promises to us. What hope, what encouragement, what joy, and what challenge uh, to us as we realize the seriousness of what's going to take place here in the end times. Everything is about Christ. It is about a life-to-life -life relationship with him because of him with others. Last week we started just a segue from Revelation for three weeks. Last week, this week, and next week. We're just engaging the reality of what does Jesus Christ mean in our life. And we're going to come back into the book of Revelation, pick it up in chapter 6 and move forward. Right now we're looking just simply at the, at the reality of just life to life. Every day we live, it's about relationships. That's the most important thing. It is life to life. Ours with his, ours with others. That's what it's all about. And, uh, and so this morning, as we pick up this second element of, of these this three weeks, we're looking at how life to life, that relationship, it reveals a genuine relationship. When we are engaged with Christ, it reveals something genuine that's there. It's personal. Luke chapter 10. He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, your soul. That's what he promises. It is personal. It is individual. Uh, these aren't things that, that uh, a church programs. It's, it's not about uh, policies. It's not about, it's not about church programs. Uh, it's not about all those things. It's about every individual within a given church their relationship, your relationship with Christ. That's what this is all about. This is very personal. You shall love the Lord your God. Well, you do, do you do that this morning? Do you love him this morning? Is that how you would define your relationship? Is that how we would define our relationship? God, Lord Jesus Christ, I love, I love you this morning. God's love, we need to remember, it defines him and it defines us. God loves us, Revelation 1.5 and many other places, John just puts at the very beginning of this important uh, last book of the Bible about Jesus Christ to him who loves us. We are called to love him as well. It's that love relationship. We love because he first loved us, 1 John 1, 9. It's reciprocal. He loves us, and in response, we love him. That's what this is all about. See, the problem is, and we saw this last week, the Word of God places a, an emphasis on, on the need for us to experience, to come under the love of God. His forgiveness, His healing. And then in response to, to, to enter into that love relationship with Him. We saw last week as well the reality of sin. Sin simply comes in and messes those things up. The church in Ephesus uh, had now reached the place where they simply didn't love the Lord and, and were not functioning and being defined by that love like they were when they first were saved. We saw the parable of the sower and the seed where it really is a love for something else that prevents an unbeliever from stepping into a relationship with Jesus Christ. God's love transforms us. It's one person. It's one heart at a time. That's what we're looking at. Whatever we, whatever we do for Christ, it depends upon, it's generated first from what we are becoming in Christ. Today's, today's focus and emphasis in this sermon, this message, this time together as we just gather around God's word, isn't about what we are to do. It's about, it's about what we are to become, what we are to be in Jesus Christ. This is the most important thing. This is the most essential this is what defines us more than anything else. We think that what we do oftentimes defines us, but it's what we are inside that truly defines us. And so it's be versus do. You had, you had those, you have those in Matthew 7 who will stand before the Lord and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do mighty works in your name? Look at all, Lord, look at all that we did. And he will say to the unbeliever there, depart from me, I never, I never knew you. There was no being, there was no Christ in them. And they did a lot of things that maybe Christ would, would call us to do, but without relationship with Jesus Christ. And so everything else was religion. It was an effort to gain his favor. It was nullified 
by the sin that covered everything good that might come out of one's life. And so this is very important for us to remember. And so this morning I want to remind us of the reality of genuine relationship in Jesus Christ. What does that mean for all of us? What does that mean? We'll look at four areas. We're going to lay before us a concept that's just been in front of this church, an emphasis that's been in front of the church for a long time. Um, what we see here initially is, is Christ initiates into our life. In this genuine relationship that's revealed in our life, it starts with Christ. He initiates that work in our life. He offers relationship in our life. And so we're going to look at this grid of this O-H-I-O that we use here uh, in the church and in ministry to just, to just remind us. It's, it's, it's a, a, a foundation point for what the Word of God teaches. This first element is a reminder of the importance of outreach in the life of a church, an importance of evangelism in the life of a church. But you know where that starts? We're not going to talk about evangelism out there today. We're going to talk about how the Lord Jesus Christ first, first evangelized us, how he first reached into our heart and your heart, and that's where everything started. That's where it all began. He initiates that relationship. If you know Jesus Christ this morning and you're listening, he started that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 reminds us that because of that, we are a new creation. We're brand new. The old things that defined us, that's behind us now. That passed away, doesn't it? We still struggle with sin, but we're brand new in Jesus Christ. We have new capabilities, a new future, new hope, new power, new enablement. All those things. He has placed within us a new heart. We see this in the Old Testament looking ahead. Ezekiel chapter 36. I will give you, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. See, that's what he promises. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The flesh here isn't sin. The flesh here is a heart that's pliable. It's conformable. It's responsive in relationship to Christ, to the love of Jesus Christ. God promised Israel, and ultimately all of us, that when we are saved, this is exactly what takes place. I will replace that heart of stone with a heart that is pliable, conformable, that is mine, belongs to me. We think of the example of Lydia. She was wealthy. Uh, she had means. She was a woman of influence. She was a worshiper of God, just like many of the Jews were. She, she worshiped God, but she did not know Christ. She did not have that relationship with Christ. And it says here, as she, was, as she encountered Paul and his ministry of giving and sharing the gospel, that the Lord opened her heart. When you were saved, it was because the Lord opened your heart, just like he did here, Lydia. That's how it works all the time. This is God's work. It takes place every day. It's the work of salvation. And our heart is transformed. That transformation is necessary. If we're truly to impact other people for Jesus Christ, the Lord touches our heart. He transforms our heart. He takes our heart. And if we're going to be effective in outreach, we're going to talk about that next week. It has to start first here. If he hasn't transformed my heart, if he doesn't touch my heart, then a lot of things take place. Uh, then I see people. I only see them as issues. I don't see them as people with need. Uh, I see people and I turn away from them and their needs. I don't turn towards them as ministry and as opportunity. I talk about people. I don't pray for them. Um, I'll not care for them. I'll not extend grace to them. I'll not extend God's love to them. Because outreach, that mentality of reaching others isn't in my heart if I don't know Jesus Christ. I'm not cultivating that. I'll not reflect Jesus Christ to them. If transformation hasn't happened in my own heart, then I won't, I won't do these things in my own life. I'm not going to go. He, the Lord sends every believer. We are sent. Not just missionaries. Not just pastors. We are all sent into our world, into our life, to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. If I don't grab a hold of this relationship that I have in Christ, I won't be one who responds and cares about the needs of other people. I'm going to miss out on the blessing. I'm going to remain focused on me and not, not the work that God's called me to do. And so this has to be my prayer. What is my prayer as God touches my heart as He is with salvation, as He plants new life in my soul, what becomes the prayer of a new believer? What becomes the prayer of a growing believer? What becomes our prayer when it comes to evangelism and outreach? Prayer is this. Because it's a heart matter, my prayer might be something like this. Lord, help me never to forget what you've done in my heart. Help me to never forget that. That will impact everything else I do. God, help me to never forget what you did in my life. So that means we have to, we have to continually remember what he did. 
refresh our, our mind, write it down, share it verbally in testimony. That's what we do. Lord, help me never forget. Our commitment then becomes this. Lord, this is my commitment. I'm going to pray for a sense of urgency in my heart for the lives of other people who need Christ. This is my commitment. God, I'm making this commitment from my heart. This is a heart matter. This isn't a, this isn't a doing matter out there. This is a, be, this is a being issue. It's I'm going to be this in my heart because of what Jesus Christ did for me. God, I pray that you will keep on my heart continually a sense of urgency so that I go into each day with that sense of urgency. And transformation takes place because I care about people. I care about them. The people need the Lord. So what becomes the, my testimony? When God's touching my heart this way, He saves me. He's doing a new work in my life. Evangelism and my, and my awareness of the needs of others around me uh, is, becomes real because of what He did for me. This becomes my testimony before, uh, before others. This is what people see. This is what the reality of my life. Because of what God's doing in my life, I'm able to express. I'm able to express a genuine compassion for the lost. When God's touching my heart, before I ever share, I first have a heart that's compassionate for people. I see people and I see their needs. I see people and the challenges they have and I see their needs. And I'm compassionate about those needs. And I desire to be used of God to reach out with the gospel, with, with good news, and to share it. God fills my heart with compassion. That's the first, that's the first response. Uh, uh, fruit, reality of a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. He touches my heart. Evangelism pours from my heart. Evangelism changes my heart. Jesus Christ touches my heart. He changes me. Because He changes me, my heart changes as I look at others. I pray that, that God will do that in your heart and mind. But what a challenge for all of us. For God to, to take our hearts and shape them so that, so that they beat with the values, the priorities, and the love, the grace of Jesus Christ. It's not I, but Christ. I don't do these things on my own. I don't do these things in my own ability. I can't cultivate this on my own. It's not a, it's not a feeling that I have for others. It's not, a, it's not something that I work up. It is being tender to the Lord. It is being mindful of what God has always done in my heart. Never forgetting that. Having a humility because of what Jesus Christ did for me. And then having a, a passion, a desire, an, urgence, an urgency to share Jesus Christ. That's where it begins. Pray now that God will do that in your heart. He will develop that in your heart. The second area of genuine relationship in this O-H-I-O -O is, this, is this matter of, of worship. The, a believer, because Jesus Christ reaches into my life, now I embrace Jesus Christ. When we receive Jesus Christ, that's what we were doing. We are saying, Lord, I embrace everything that you are. Lord, you are, you are the one that, that I need not only for salvation and for forgiveness and for life change, but for everything that I might ever do, I might ever accomplish. And so I turn, I turn the eyes of my heart to the Lord. Now, now the priority of where I look is not at the things around me that I might have and might hold on to and might, and might attain. It's not the people around me. My eyes are directed to Christ. He becomes my focus. He becomes my passion. I embrace Jesus Christ. This heaven word, this heaven word emphasis is all about worship. It's all about, Lord, I need you, and so and so prayer becoming the the oil of of my life, that which allows me to function day in and day out. We have a new relationship. We embrace Jesus Christ in worship. Psalm 82, 86, 12. With my whole heart. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, and I will glorify your name forever with my whole heart, with everything that I am. God, I'm going to, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to treasure you. I'm going to put you over everything else in my life. Because of sin, that's not always the reality of our heart from day to day, from moment to moment. When we yield to Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God has His way, then worship becomes the reality of our life and we place Jesus Christ first and foremost over our heart. And our desire is to honor and to glorify His name. Relationship becomes worship, genuine relationship. 
in Revelation 5, which we were just in. And they simply praised him and sang to him, you are worthy, worthy are you. For you ransomed people for God. We are ransomed people. We never forget. We worship God. I worship God because of what he did in my life. And he saved me. He changed me. He paid a price I could not pay. He freed me from sin. He gave me a hope. He gave me a future. And he's doing that every day from every tribe, every nation, every people, every time. That's what he's doing. Relationship then reflects. It's, it's defined by love. As Christ dwells in, in your heart and my heart through faith, that happens. as that happens, we are rooted, we are grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. We, we come to know him and his love. When we receive Jesus Christ for the first time, an individual experiences what love really means. To be forgiven, to not be defined by, by your sins and your failures, which we all have. When we're saved, we own them. Lord, this is who I am. This is what I've done. Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm bankrupt. I can bring nothing to you. And he loves us. He forgives us and he cleanses us and he washes us. And we're now defined and molded by the love of Jesus Christ. That becomes our identity, that relationship. Now you're a part of the body of Christ. That's not just a matter of gifts in the body of Christ here, 1 Corinthians 12. It's a matter of identity. We are now a part of the body of Christ. I belong to him. It is ownership. He is my authority. He is my master. He is my Lord. He is the one that I worship. I adore. I praise. I honor. I come before. The relationship then results and it becomes proclamation in my life. This is all genuine relationship. This is all the response of the believer. We're chosen. We're a chosen race. Why? That we, just, that we might proclaim Jesus Christ. That our lives might just pulsate with the story, the narrative, the reality of what Jesus Christ has done. Many of us need to go back to that starting place. Many of us need to go back to that, to this, to this expression of the heart and say, Lord, I've lost some of this. I want this. That I might proclaim the excellencies, the wonders of the Savior who saved me and called me from darkness into light. If we're going to truly impact others, then our heart needs to be transformed when it comes to worship. See, if I don't worship, I become weak. If I don't worship, I become vulnerable. I become ungrateful. I become uncommitted, confused, a doubting, a disappointed in life. If I don't worship, then life becomes a performance. Life becomes superficial. When I don't worship, I lose the vitality of living. When I don't worship, I lose, I lose a depth of the riches of relationship with Jesus Christ. When I don't worship, I lose, a, I lose spiritual health, vitality, that healthy connection with Jesus Christ. When I don't worship, then it's reflected in my relationship to other people. When I'm not worshiping, others will notice. When, when you and I are not worshiping God, when he's not, we're, not, we're not letting him change us, when we're not yielding ourselves before him, others will notice. People will be problems. People will be issues. People won't be opportunity in our life. So here, this is my prayer. When it comes to worship, this is the prayer that, that maybe, maybe we can pray together when it comes to that genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. Lord, fill me with the joy of you. Not just joy. God, just give me joy today. God, give me the joy of you. That's, that's the, the fulfillment of relationship. God, give me, give me the joy of you today. In every circumstance, every challenge, every relationship, every opportunity, may I experience and be aware of the joy of you. This is my commitment then. Lord, I will, I will enjoy you every day. That's, that's, that's something that you and I can do every day. At the end of the day, Lord, how have I enjoyed you today? How are you joy in my heart today? If I can fill that in, from my heart, then I have worshipped God today. Not just getting on my knees and not just praying and not just being with a corporate body and singing praises to Him. No, I've worshipped because I have practiced the presence of God in my life. Transformation then is it occurs in our life. The Lord brings humility. He brings joy. He brings power into my life. That's what He does. That's the reality. That's the joy. That's beautiful. God becomes real in my life. I seek Him, I desire Him, I pursue Him. When I'm praying these things, my heart begins to change. My heart reflects. There is something authentic there. There's something real there. 
I can come to church and I can be with other believers and I can sing praises and I can pray. But if the Lord doesn't change me and I don't let him and I don't offer to him the tenderness of my heart, I haven't worshiped. When I can encounter Jesus Christ, when I can encounter God in worship, but keep him at a distance, I haven't worshiped. It is a tenderness of heart. Lord, may this happen. When that's taking place, this becomes my testimony before others. This is the reality. This is something that because of what God's doing, it's not I, it's Christ, I'm able to do. I'm able to express what the Lord, what God, what Jesus Christ personally means to me. Could you sit down right now with your family as you're listening? Could you convey that? I'm not asking you to do that. It may take time for you to consider, wow, what would I say? But could you do that? Would you desire to do that? Here's what the Lord, here's what he means to me. This is what he means to me. And then convey that with my life. Show that with my life. My heart is his. Then a believer, a child of God, is able to do this. Is able to convey and share a, a compassion for people who need the Lord. Could you do that with your family? Here's, here's who I am praying for, compassionate, overburdened for in my life. With your family, with others who know you. Here's what the Lord is doing in my life. Here's, how, here's what God, here's what he means to me. Here's how he's touched and is touching my life. It leads us to the third place. Jesus initiates into our life. We respond, it's worship. And then he, he continues to initiate his work in our life. He pursues relationship. This is that inward ministry. We think of the inward ministry. We think of uh, the one another's. We think of, of being a servant. We think of all those things. It starts, it starts when Jesus Christ pursues us. See, he's the one who initiates that. We only do those other things because he's pursuing us. That's what he's doing. I tell you what, this is powerful. In the Old Testament, we encounter Israel. Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah says, you, Israel, you are a people who survived the sword. In other words, discipline, the wrath of God because of sin. And yet you found grace in the wilderness. And God says, I have loved you. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I've continued my faithfulness to you. Do you see what's happening here? God continued to pursue Israel time and time and time again, even though they sinned over and over again, just like you and I do. In Revelation, we see the very same dynamic in the New Testament with believers of the church. Revelation 3 in Laodicea. Those whom I love, I reprove, I discipline. He does that. And then he says this in the next verse. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him, eat with him, and he with me. That's fellowship. Do you know that Jesus Christ right now, he is pursuing you and he's doing it all the time. He is initiating that, that expression of love into your life all the time. Why? Because I need pursuing. Why? Because you need pursuing. You know what? Because sin is a reality in my life. He changed me. I'm a new creation. I have power and I have an enablement in Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God through His Word to, to honor Him and to do the right thing. But you know what? Sin's always with me. It's always a spiritual battle. And I don't always win. I could, hypothetically, I could win every battle if I simply yielded to the Lord. But none of us can reach that level of perfection, of sanctification on this side of eternity because sin is a reality. We simply can't do it. We can desire it, wish it, and be passionate about that. But it is the Holy Spirit that makes it happen. And we never arrive in that, to that place of perfection until we're with the Lord. But you know what? He's always pursuing you. I want you to be encouraged this morning. Your heart may not be where it needs to be. You may look into your relationship with Christ and say, Wow, I'm, I'm really deficient and where I need to be, and I, I, I'm a, I have failed, and I've sinned, and, I, and I've made choices that, that simply, I know they're not pleasing the Lord, and I'm doing things right now that don't please the Lord. Now, I want you to know right now, the Lord is pursuing you because He loves you so much. He's pursuing you right now. He wants to draw you, woo, woo you back to Him. That's what He does. How did He do that? How does He show that? Well, He served you and I. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. He serves you. He serves His church. He served when He came in the flesh and became man. He had that public ministry of being a servant. He went to the cross because He was a servant. 
He continues to serve you and his church, the genuine believers. He serves us because he loves us. He gives us that example. And he places that heart into the heart of every believer. What we proclaim, Paul says, is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. With ourselves as your servants for the sake of Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ, we are serving you, Paul says, whenever we serve anyone else, and we do it with authenticity and genuineness in the Lord, we're doing it for the sake of Jesus Christ, to reflect him, to encourage others to come back to Christ because of that love relationship. If you're not where you need to be, I encourage you to be reminded God loves you and he is serving you with his people, with his Holy Spirit in your heart, with his word. He serves you. He's pursuing you. He touches our heart for service. So we see this in the Old Testament. God, Saul, Saul has protectors, men who gather around him. And many men went with him, men of valor at Gibeah, to, to stand with him, identify with him, protect him, serve him. Why? Because their hearts were touched by God. You know why they did that? Saul wasn't the king that God intended as as that first king, he gave Israel king because of their sin, their disobedience. But you know what? He still moved the hearts of men to serve their king. Whenever we serve, it's because God has moved our heart. Is God able to move your heart? You know, it's only by the Spirit of God that we can do this. Jesus says these words, let the greatest among you become as the youngest. Man, that's amazing. And the leader as the one who serves. For who's greater? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Of course. Is it not the one who reclines at the table? Of course. But I am among you as the one who serves. Don't be the, the CFO. Don't be the chairman, the guy in charge. Don't be the boss. Be the one who is as the youngest. Be the one who's willing to serve. I tell you what, that is counter-cultural. That's counter to the heart of man. That's counter to my heart. Unless Jesus Christ is at work. Don't be the pastor in, in the role always. Be the pastor who is, a, who is a man willing to serve his people. All of us are called to serve Jesus Christ, to have that heart. We're to value others as we are valued. First Peter, you were ransomed. Never forget that, ever. We were ransomed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We can't ever forget that. He served us, gave his very life for us. And I remember that. Then I... I should never fight when God calls me to be a servant. I should never fight that, that impulse to yield myself and to be nothing and to serve because that's what Jesus Christ did for me. Why do I forget that? Why do I, why do I find it so hard sometimes to serve others, maybe difficult people or in situations or when I'm tired or when I... Why do I find it so hard? Because the sin is with me. Because when I reflect on this and I think about this, then the only proper response that should be my response that should be our response, is that we're simply willing to serve others. Our heart needs to be transformed, folks, if this is going to happen. If we're going to truly impact people for Jesus Christ, our heart has to be changed. He's got to grab a hold of your heart and mind. It's the only way it can take place. Before we do anything out there, we have to become. If, I don't have, if, if I'm not investing in my walk with Jesus Christ, I will not invest in service to other people. I won't serve people. If I'm not investing in Christ and in in being his, I will not invest in others as well. It won't happen. When I serve others, but my heart's not right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to manipulate them to my end. I'm going to use people. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to love them. I'm going to do it outwardly. But inwardly, I'm going to devalue them, demean them, talk about them, put them down in my mind or before others. When I don't have a servant's heart, I may, I may go through the act of being a servant, but inwardly, I won't have a servant's heart. And you know what? It'll come out. And people will get hurt terribly. I will get hurt, and the people around me will get hurt. And Jesus Christ, his testimony will get martyred. We need to pray for a servant's heart. Here's the prayer. God, give me a servant's heart. God, give that to me. God, give me a servant's heart. My commitment, Lord, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray the, the biblical one another's of Scripture over my heart. God, love is expressed in these one another mandates. We've talked about these often in the life of this church. God, I'm going to pray those, I'm going to pray those over my heart, that you will transform my heart with those biblical principles for love. 
And then the transformation is this. I'm simply looking for opportunities to serve others for the sake of Jesus Christ. So my testimony becomes this. My testimony before others. This is what I'm able to to share because there's something genuine and authentic in my heart when it comes to the area of service. I'm, I'm careful to value every believer as precious before the Lord. I'm able to convey that. I'm able to convey no matter who I'm encountering in the body of Jesus Christ that they are valuable to me. You are valuable to me. You know what? That just doesn't come out of our life all the time with every expression, with every relational encounter unless Jesus Christ has hold of my heart. Unless the Spirit of God has hold of my heart. I'm asking you, how's your heart this morning? When, it, when you think about these three areas of life in relation to your heart and your relationship with Jesus Christ, how is God speaking to you? What would he have you, where would he have you to grow in, to be more like him? It's not I, but Jesus Christ. And then Jesus initiates this. He pursues this. He he expresses that inward ministry to his church, the body of Christ. He pursues us. He pursues us. He pursues us because he loves us. And the believer responds. Again, here we are. The believer responds. The believer responds to Jesus Christ, what he's doing. That pursuit of love, that pursuit of his being a servant to us. And we are conformed to Jesus Christ. We conform ourselves to the heart, to the image, to the character, the person of Jesus Christ. This is that last O-H-I-O. This is O onward. It is that is that intentional walk of growth. Intentionally becoming like Christ. Sustaining that spiritual growth in our life. We're on a new path. Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight. God, I love. It is my passion to do your will. Oh my God. Your law, the word of God, it's within my heart. When we are, when we, when the Lord grabs a hold of our heart, then what He does is He gives a, a tenderness to our heart, and and we want to do His will, just as Jesus wanted to do the will of His Father. Always, in every moment, in every way, Jesus was committed to doing the will of His Father, and when He's working in your heart and mine, then we are committed to that same commitment. We are committed to the will of the Father. Why? Because my heart remembers. 2 Thessalonians 3, 5. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God. I remember. I remember His love. How He's faithful every day in loving me. How He's faithful every day in pursuing me. How He was faithful in dying for me. I remember all these things and I pursue Him and I conform my heart to Him and to the steadfastness of Christ, the endurance of Christ, the perseverance of Christ. He didn't just give up on me. He's not given up on you. He pursues you. He loves you. He's working in your heart and mind. Be encouraged about that. He said, it is finished. He says, I have have completed the work, Father, that you gave me to do. He persevered to the end. And so our heart grows tender. That's why we conform. Blessed is the one who honors, fears, worships the Lord always. But whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity, all kinds of troubles. When I make my heart tender, when I conform to him, when I honor him, worship him, and yield to him, my heart is tender and soft. And I I find myself then in the place where I'm able to yield and be conformed. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your your hard ground, your fallow ground. For it's time to seek the Lord. Folks, it's time. Right now, it's time to seek the Lord. If our church, if we in our individual lives are going to make a difference, a real difference, a genuine difference in ministry and in our community and the people in our lives, this has to take place first. This is the groundwork. This issue of the heart has to come first. If if your heart and my heart is not where it needs to be, my ministry and its expression of doing will be impacted and tainted and corrupted. You can count on it. And so I pursue Jesus Christ in his heart. Put on, put it on, be intentional, put on the new self, put on Christ, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Be right with God, be pure before God, holy, Don't let sin define you. Let his righteousness, his holiness, be where you need to be in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And a transformed heart 
It's necessary. If I'm going to conform to Jesus Christ, to his character, to his, my heart must be transformed. If I don't, if, if I'm not transformed, if, if, if I don't let Jesus Christ touch my heart as a believer, then I will not know, I will not experience the fruit of the Spirit. I'll, I'll not exhibit, I'll not know, express the character of Jesus Christ. And so those things will be missing from my life and from my testimony. At the end of the day, if they're continually always missing from my life, do I know Jesus Christ? But remember, if you know Jesus Christ and you look into your heart and your relationship with the Lord, and so these things are missing, then remember He's pursuing you right now. He loves you. Would you yield to Him? Listen to Him? Respond to Him? If I'm not doing these things, I'm not going to grow. I'm going to be stagnant. I'm going to be controlled by sin in my life. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to have control, and it doesn't need to. He freed us from sin. He freed us from that bondage. If we're under control, it's because we choose to be under control, not because we're helpless. He's given us the ability, the enablement, the power to overcome. That's his promise. To every church in Revelation, he says you are to be overcomers. Every man, every woman, every child, every teenager, every grandma and grandpa, he says to them, you are to be overcomers. It is to define you. Why? Because it's not you. It's Christ. It's not I. Christ. We can do it as we yield to Christ. Yeah. If I'm not conforming, I run the risk of maybe not being a child of God. That's how important that is. So this becomes my prayer. What is my prayer? Lord, change me. Lord, make me like you. I tell you what, if these, if these reflect our heart, if these prayers genuinely come from our heart, God's going to do a work in your life. That's a guarantee to you. Yes, adversity is going to be a part of life because he's called us to adversity. He uses it in our life to shape us, to purify us, to mold us like him, to, to give us opportunity to be witness, testimony. But I tell you what, he will, he will walk with you, give you enablement, love, grace, mercy. He will be with you every moment and, and give you power. That's his promise. It's a guarantee. If these are the expressions of my heart, God will change your life for the better and he will be represented by your life. This is the commitment. When I'm willing to conform to Jesus Christ, this onward process, this becomes the commitment of my heart. I'm going to feed my soul. I'm going to strengthen my heart through God's word. And God's word is going to be the food for my soul. Every day it's going to be a priority. It, I will feed. I will read. I will, God, I'm going to know your heart. I will pursue you in the Old Testament and New Testament. I'm going to read about you. I want to know you so that I can reflect you understand you, show you in my life. The transformation then is this. Is this because my prayer and my commitment, then the Spirit of God does a transformation. The fruit of the Spirit is a reality in my life. The character of Christ is stamped on my life. That's the reality. Not I, but Christ. This becomes my testimony before others. This is what people see. I'm able to exhibit growth. I'm able to share how Christ is changing me. Could you share right now with your family, with someone that's close to you? I want you to know, this is how Christ is changing my life. This is what he's doing in my life right now. He's changing me. I used to think this way. I used to do this. I used to respond this way. I used to, but you know what? The Lord's changing me. I've been in his word. I've been listening to the spirit of God as he speaks to me. I have pursued and sought the heart of Christ. And I've just been reminded of how beautiful he is. And I have learned to enjoy him. And you know what? He's changing me. And I'm seeing the Spirit of God at work in my life. And the way I respond is new. It's different. It's not like it used to be. And, and the character of Christ, you know what? My character is changing. And all this is a reminder. You know what? It's not I. It's the Christ. So here's our prayer. God, change my heart. God, just change my heart. Change my heart. I yield. Change my heart. Change my heart. In every moment, in every decision, one moment at a time, one at a time. God, do that. God, change me. I know you're not going to, it's not going to, I'm not going to be perfect. Change me. One, one decision, one day, one moment at a time. With the next decision, with the next moment, God, would I honor you. Every time we honor Jesus Christ and conform to him and do the right thing and follow his heart, it's easier to do again in the next time. God, transform every part of my heart every part of my heart. Lord, I'm willing. God, I'm willing. Change me. That's the challenge of 
the word of God to us today. May the Lord speak into your heart. Would you let him touch your heart and change you? I've not, I've not given you here all the how-tos. I've given you what the heart needs to express to the Lord. What needs to happen in your heart? If God is speaking to your heart, he will help you with the how-tos. He will help you with the specifics. He will help you and we will help you. But it first needs to start with you, with me, listening to him first. May the Lord do this. Lord, touch our hearts, we pray, for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining with us. Next week we finish this. I'm looking forward to that. I can't wait. And I invite you to come back. Be with us again. Continue to grow. Be listening to what Jesus Christ would have you to do this week. We'll see you.